Thank you for the very nice bio. My credentials, however, pale compared to everyone else on this panel here. I'm honored to, um, to, to, to have such a distinguished panel. To my right is uh, Joe Nocera, who of course is a columnist for the New York Times, uh, who in uh, the past year or so has taken a real interest in the issues of, of college sports. Um, to his right is Wally Renfro, who is the senior advisor for the NCAA. I've known Wally for a number of years. Uh, Wally is not the, the front man for the NCAA, but he is one of, he's a very significant figure in his own right. He's one of uh, only three people who has been with the NCAA since the days of Walter Byers. So he knows the history of the NCAA. He knows the philosophy of the NCAA. He is, uh, had been, has been intimately involved in creating policy for the NCAA uh, over the years. And we're very happy uh, that, that Wally has uh, been willing to uh, join this, uh, this panel. Um, to his right is Taylor Branch, who of course is a uh, Pulitzer Prize winning author and historian who has also taken an interest in the issues of college sport over the past year. He wrote an article of a length that my magazine editors would never let me write. <laughs> uh, how many words was that, uh, Taylor? Um, I don't know, maybe 12,000, something like that. Yeah, it doesn't matter, whatever you want to write. <laughs> we'll publish it, 12,000 words. It was a fantastic uh, piece, very much a critique of the NCAA. You know, Taylor has a point of view um, and uh, he's a former college football player himself. Um, but uh, it was a very thought-provoking piece that got a lot of attention in a number of circles. Uh, and to his right is Craig Robinson, who besides being the First Lady's uh, big brother, is the men's basketball coach at uh, Oregon State University and uh, someone of the highest uh, caliber uh, and character. In fact, he wrote a book a couple of years ago called A Game, uh, a Game of Character? A Game of Character. A Game of Character about uh, the values he was raised uh, with in Chicago um, by his mother and his father. And uh, you get a real sense of, of uh, Michelle Obama and himself and this uh, amazing family that has uh, done so much in the world. So thank you everyone for, uh, for, for joining us. Um, let me just kind of, I'm going to throw out a, a simple question here to in a second, um, but let me kind of tell you about the state of college sports today. I'll just give you a few fact points. This week, the, uh, uh, we saw the introduction of a four-team uh, football playoff at the highest level of college football um, that will uh, introduce many new millions of dollars, maybe tens of millions of dollars, maybe hundreds of million uh, millions of dollars uh, into the college sports pool. Um, there will, so there will be now a, a semifinal, um, uh, and then there will be a final, an extra game that the, uh, the NCAA, I guess the executive board must, must sign off on, but it looks like it's... It's, it's, it's uh, not an NCAA uh, event, and uh, so the NCAA governance structure actually will have nothing to do with that decision. I, I read that they, because there's an additional game being added... There ah, has the to additional be. game will require uh, legislation, yes. Right, I got gotcha. you. Yeah. Okay, so... We've had the four-team playoff. We see huge television contracts. I work with ESPN, which does a lot of business with, uh, with, um, with, with the NCAA and, and the different conferences. Uh, it gets very good ratings. Um, fans have responded to it. Uh, they love their college sports. Uh, they love March Madness. It's never been healthier. Uh, some schools have um, experienced incredible uh, gains in revenue growth. The University of Texas football team brings in about 125 million dollars a year or so now. Um, and their coach is paid about five million dollars a year. On the other hand, we have school budgets um, within even, even within NCAA's top division that, that pale compared to that 125. I mean, they're, uh, they're getting by on much, they're trying to get by on much, much less and compete with the big boys as well. We've seen some legal cases that have challenged the structure of the NCAA. Uh, most uh, notably the, what they call the O'Bannon case, uh, which speaks to the NCAA's ability to sell the likenesses and the, um, the, the images of, of college athletes in, in video games or uh, archival materials or otherwise. Um, we have these two distinguished uh, columnists and authors who have decided to take up these issues, folks who 
haven't really written about, and maybe I'm wrong about that, haven't written a whole lot about college sports in the past who said, you know what, uh, this is of interest and, and we need to pay attention to these topics. Um, and we've seen this Manning conference shifting where you know, the Big East is pulling in teams from you know, 2,000 miles away to be part of their conference now. Everybody is just chasing the money. Rivalries are disappearing. And, uh, and we have this, this game that really seems in, in flux. So my question to each of you, and I wanna, maybe we just kind of roll through the panel here one by one. Maybe you can talk for a couple minutes uh, on this. But my question is, what does all that tell you about the sustainability of what the NCAA calls the collegiate model? Joe? Uh, <laughs> well, if you, if, you, if you look at what just happened with the BCS and also with the super conferences, what you see is conference heads doing what good businessmen do all the time. They're maximizing revenue. That's what they're doing. That's what this is all about. It has nothing to do with rivalries. It has nothing to do with really the sort of old-fashioned healthy competition that the uh, NCAA likes to idealize. Um, it's about maximizing revenues. And one way to think about what the NCAA does, I'm sure Wally would not agree with me on this, but it's also helping universities maximizing revenues by ensuring that the uh, employees, i.e. the athletes, um, who are generating all this money for the universities to the tune of, I, I've been told that men's basketball and football combined is a $6 billion industry uh, where the labor force gets nothing. So that, the, so the question to, in my mind is, is that sustainable? Uh, on the one hand, it has been sustained for a very long time. You know, the phrase student athlete was invented by Walter Byers uh, as a piece of propaganda because states were beginning to think about classifying football and basketball players as employees. And um, you can argue all you want about the value of a scholarship and um, so on and so forth, but the more you learn about the way basket big time basketball and football operates, the more you realize how much of it, not all of it, but aspects of it are a sham. The great thing every, they all, th it has going for it is you're using 18 and 19 year old kids who are not going to go on strike. They're not going to do anything about this. They're all dying to play. They all think they're going to be professionals. So that speaks to the sustainability of this model, however unjust it may be. What speaks to the unsustainability of it is the, um, the potential for, as, as the business aspects of it become more and more obvious, the potential for courts to take a different look at it or the potential for society as a whole to say, is it really right for universities which have a, a, a certain mission and have certain financial uh, uh, restraints right now to be operating what amounts to minor league professional sports? And if the society 20 years from now or over the course of the next bunch of years says no, it will change. And if the society says yes, then it is sustainable. Joe, you're going to probably be surprised at this. Um, he and I could be great friends. We've just met. But I agree with you. <laughs> so here's the deal. I believe that it, in fact, is the obligation of higher education, of intercollegiate athletics, of conference commissioners, of athletics directors to maximize revenue. That's the job of any enterprise, including not-for-profit enterprises. Their job is to maximize revenues. Where they part way with for-profits is how those revenues are used. In the case of not-for-profits, they're used for a purpose. And the purpose that drives higher education is education. So the issue that comes to, to bear is about whether uh, intercollegiate athletics is about education or not. Uh, I believe it is. Uh, I believe it is. Uh, in, in fact, in, in exactly the same way that almost everything else on a campus is about education. We know that, because we, we know because they, say, they tell us this, we know that student athletes learn about uh, important elements of what it's gonna take to be an adult uh, when they are on the field or court. They learn about teamwork, they learn about self-sacrifice, they learn about pursuit of excellence, they learn about resilience. They learn that defeat is, 
is only a point of time. It's not a condition of life. Not only do they learn that, but they model those characteristics for those of us who spectate. So there's educational value in my, from my perspective in the participation in intercollegiate athletics. That's the reason it has been sustained and justified in higher education for more than a century. I suspect that that's the reason it will be into the, into the future. The revenue that comes in from, uh, from intercollegiate athletics certainly only comes uh, uh, basically to a few institutions. Uh, in, there are only 22 institutions last year that had revenues that exceeded their expenses, only 22. Um, you could probably make a list of who you think those, those 22 institutions are. Um, all the others had to sustain this in, in, in the same way that they sustain other parts of higher education. So they sustain philosophy uh, uh, department, never makes money, uh, but they sustain it through uh, uh, courses in psychology, sociology, English, history survey courses, because they, want, because they believe that's part of a comprehensive education. So intercollegiate athletics is a component. It works the way everything else on campus works. Um, and institutions m more often, far more often, subsidize it because they believe in that educational justification uh, than those who actually uh, generate the revenue. But if everybody could generate as, you know, if we could triple or quadruple the revenue, we'd be worlds better off because there would be a lot more student athletes who could participate. Taylor? Well, um, hmm. This is an amazing new field. I'm going to try to say a couple of surprising things. I think college sports is actually more stable right now than colleges themselves uh, and my own book writing industry. And the, exper and the experience of writing about college sports uh, has hurtled me into that uh, realization. I went as a tourist uh, for James Bennett, the editor of The Atlantic. Uh, to survey, the, do a capsule history of um, uh, sports in America and why we're the only country in the world that has big money sports played at institutions of higher learning. It was an amazing experience to do, uh, to learn that. My secondary mission was from my old college president, Bill Friday, who's a reformer at North Carolina, who said to me essentially, uh, Taylor, go in there and drain the money out of the swamp and give my university back to Socrates. Um, that was his mission, and I had to tell him at the end that, uh, that I couldn't do that, uh, but that it was an amazing experience. Certainly when my article came out, it not, hasn't been that long ago, it kind of blew up in my face, and a number of very instructive things happened. I had gone five months earlier saying the Atlantic wasn't going to publish to the fall to my own publisher in New York of 40 years saying I had to, as long as the article was, I had to leave out things not pertaining to money, to a chapter on Title IX, a thing on academic standards that actually makes, in my view, the NCAA look pretty good, and a number of other things. Would you like to publish this as, a, uh, as an airport paperback in case this issue catches fire? Gosh, this is wonderful material, but we're already working on books for 13 months from now for the fall of 2012. It's, it's way too late. A week or so later, a pioneer ebook company called me and said, if you've got extra material here, this is generating a lot of interest. We apologize because we would have to send the formatted book with all the other material to India to be made in a, an original ebook, and we couldn't get it up for 48 hours. It would take 48 hours to make this worldwide available. Uh, and they did that. Uh, that's how rapidly publishing is disintegrating. Um, and a few weeks later, people were complaining to me that they, their grandfather wanted this but wouldn't buy, have a Kindle, so they needed a physical book. I went to the ebook publisher, and two weeks later, they came back and said, we're experimenting with something called print on demand, where if you go to order a $3 uh, ebook, uh, you can punch another button, and they will print your own custom-made paperback, and it will be in your mail in four days. Uh, I know that exists because I bought my own book because I didn't believe it's true. And you can buy a paperback. So the publishing industry and education are changing already very rapidly. College sports is relatively stable because people love it. 
It is, it is growing, but everybody, even those who love it the most and who love the status quo say that their budget tra trajectories are not sustainable. It is to some degree a bubble, and it is gonna have a lot of uh, problems. Now, in all of the debate that has, has occurred, and it's been an amazing experience for me these last few months, I've distilled down what I thought needed to be hap happen. I put it in a little, and I have a, a whole bunch of them if you're interested. Three-point reform, transparency, balance, and equity. Transparency and balance are much discussed by many people about how to regulate and govern and balance academics and sports and, and have the whole academic community step up to a governance role that they've largely abdicated in many respects and, and join uh, the NCAA that way. But I want to say as my last comment, and this is where the controversy hits and the rubber meets the road. The third one is equity. What is the rights of the athletes? And it is my opinion that nobody wants to talk about that. Everybody evades it. Everybody circumvents it and says most athletes are not going to go pro or whatever. My question is what are their rights? They are creating value. Um, and I'll explain that a little bit more. And my position is if you do not deal with the rights of the athletes, the civil rights, I'm a civil rights historian, but civil rights in the, in the literal sense of rights pertaining to citizenship of the athletes who generate this revenue in college, you are wasting your time to talk about transparency, balance, or anything else. So that's gonna happen one way or another, whether it's the courts, whether there's an, a revolt of the athletes, or whether the institutions themselves summon the will to address the rights of the athletes. Craig, does the model feel sustainable to you? I mean, you're on the ground as yeah. a coach. Well, it's um, um, after kind of getting over the, which one of these doesn't look like the other. Uh, <laughs> um, <clears throat> I am on the ground, and it's good to hear Taylor say that he feels that it's sustainable. Since I left a career, you, don't, you guys don't know this, I left a 14-year career on, on Wall Street to go into coaching. So I couldn't take another bubble burst here. So uh, it's good to hear that this is sustainable. But from the ground, I think, uh, I think it's sustainable, but for a different reason. I'm out here, and I'm recruiting high school kids, and all I do is recruit. I mean. People think this is a glamorous job and you have practice and you have games and you're on television, but 80% of my time is spent on recruiting good players. Because without good players, you can't win. And what I'm seeing at the grassroots level, as you pointed out, Tom, is that there are always going to be kids to recruit. There are always going to be kids who want to go to college. Even if you allow kids to go pro right out of grammar school or high school, there would still be a group of kids who aren't good enough who would want to go and play college basketball. And um, you know, a, as a coach, it's my job to, to manage the educational part of this business along with the entertainment part. I, I, I left a, a, a great career to do something I was passionate about and uh, wound up realizing that I, I, I left, as I, as I put it, I, I'm, I went out of the frying pan and into the fire because this is big business. Let's face it, it's big business. And in order to accomplish what I want to accomplish from a civic and educational and mentoring point of uh, standpoint, I've got to straddle that line as a quasi-entertainer. Yeah. The, um, you know, Beth, you know, I told you all my respect for Beth, and here's why. We were trading emails this morning, and she made a great point. That she said that the NCAA said the business. It is a business. Uh, you know, the NCAA should be in the business of creating future leaders, right? If the NCAA does that, creates future leaders, don't they have the public on their side? Don't they have the courts on their side? Don't they, doesn't everything just sort of work out? But the question I, I would have is, I mean, is the structure such that it allows you to create leaders, right? So we have, we have, we have kids who are working 40, 45 hours a week on their sports, according to an NCAA uh, study. We have 
kids who can't take certain majors because it conflicts with their practice times. We have, um, you know, uh, just all sorts of restrictions in place because of the, 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 the demands that come along with an athletic scholarship, right? So, um, Wally, I'll start with you. I mean, is the NCAA structure such that it allows the wholesale creation of future leaders? Well, I, I don't think there's any question about that. I mean, you know, we, we, it, we're constantly doing it. Just, just look back five years, 10 years, 20 years, you know, and you, and you, and you see that. A, a former student athlete. Um, and I'm gonna tell you that, you know, in 20, 30 years from now, someone will be sitting at the Aspen Institute and, 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 and it's gonna have the same sort of, of discussion and they're gonna say is intercollegiate athletics you know, we're at a crossroads in intercollegiate athletics. I've been with the NCAA for 40 years, and this is my third or fourth cycle of crossroads that, you know, that I've been through. Uh, and, and all of us know that that's true with, with whatever it is that we work with. It's the nature of, uh, of, of human creations. You know, we go, th we go through these uh, cycles, these ups and downs. Um, you know, I'm a big believer in, um, in, in people being able to make choices. Uh, a number of years ago, we put in a rule that everybody will say, well, you know, you don't even try to enforce the rule, but, but they're not right. It's a 20-hour rule, and it's a 20-hour rule about what is, what constitutes organized uh, activity around, around the sport. And there was a world-class swimmer, whose name now is just going to flat escape me, who was, who was uh, swimming in an athletics program, who said, ah, this is ridiculous, I can't do this. I train for the Olympics. My goal is the Olympics. I can't do that. And she dropped out because she felt that she was going to be restricted. That was her choice. Mm -hmm. That was her choice. Students who come in today have a choice. You know, the, the collegiate model isn't the only model available. Mm -hmm. There are lots of other models available. For whom? From whom? For whom? If for you want to be a pro football player, what other model is available to you? You, there are, there are certainly. I mean, take a look when teams are introduced, and where they graduated from, and and I, on every team you're going to hear that someone, at least one, often more than one, lists their last place of education being a high school. Because because they didn't go to college, and they're playing at the pro level. It happens all the time. Uh, yet the in, the NFL has <coughs> set up a. Uh, an entry process into the pros, it says, you gotta wait to three years after you, uh, after you graduate from high school before you can enter uh, the draft. That certainly isn't a part of the collegiate model, that's part of the professional model. And trying to harness, or trying to, to throw that onto the back of, of intercollegiate athletics, I think is patently unfair. The, you know, I would like to see in, in basketball, I'd like to see a, a model of go now or wait three years, like they have in baseball. I like that model, I think it makes a lot of sense. Uh, but I certainly don't think that the structure, as, it, as you say, Tom, uh, interferes with the creation of, of leaders. I think we're, we're producing leaders all the time. Mm -hmm. You feel like it's I think, like the, I think that the NCAA is producing, uh, and when we're talking football and men's basketball here, we're not talking about other sports. I think what it fundamentally produces is cynicism among the athletes. Um, they take, inter, they take, they major in interdisciplinary studies, which is completely meaningless uh, in many cases. To whom? There was a great story in the Chronicle of Higher Education a few, a few weeks ago about a semi-literate football player, and one of the things, the, who majored in interdisciplinary studies, and one of the things that the reporter was able to do was, was post all his classes, so you could see what it added up to. It didn't add up to anything. The, lar the larger point to me is that um, they, the athletes know that they're there for athletics. And academics is, if they get it, great. If they don't, too bad. That's the general view uh, on the campus. Now, that may not be the NCAA's fault. That may be the, the school's fault. Maybe um, the student athlete's fault. And it may be the athlete's fault, perhaps. But, what you've created is a system where the athlete comes on to the university very often unqualified for the academic work and he gets shunted by the academic advisors into something that I like to call majoring in eligibility. 
And then once their playing days are over, they're either good enough to be professional or they're not. And then they're on their own. How this creates leaders is beyond me. Yeah, there are people on this very stage who are, st who are former athletes who are leaders. There's no question about that. But when you talk about the major what goes on in the big time football programs, for the majority, that is not about leadership. You're teaching them cynicism. Craig, what do you think? Well, it's, it's, it's hard for me because I'm sort of the exception to the rule, but I do, I have associates, counterparts, who are in the, this business solely for monetary gain, solely for the next job. There are some of my associates who are truthfully in this to be wonderful human beings and mentors to young men, and they are developing leaders. The conundrum is, and I said this at, a, at another panel, I can graduate 100% of my guys. If I lose, I will not get hired. It does not matter who I am related to. <laughs> you got me? So again, I have to work hard to be successful ethically in in, uh, from an integrity standpoint, but from a competitive standpoint to get the Tom Ferries to, to to, to bring me to a function like this so I can tell the story so that you can hear some of the other side. Now, there are not enough of me out there. I'll be the first to admit it. There, there is no maligned group more, there's no more maligned group than college basketball coaches and I, I never knew it until I became one. And it's our fault. So from, from, from my standpoint, I've gotta be, I've got the added pressure to be successful so that I can try and help fix this problem. Because the, the, the kids that I get, some of them have to start out majoring in eligibility because they've never majored in anything but basketball. But I can show them how to do both. The, um, I want to follow up on something Joe mentioned, which was that the Chronicle of Higher Education uh, piece, which was very, uh, a very good piece. But it wasn't new. I mean, we dealt with Kevin Ross back in the 1980s, who was an illiterate basketball player um, who went back and, and taught, you know, worked to figure out how to read. And it was a nice, uplifting story in the end. But the fact is, he was illiterate in college. A few years ago, I, I looked at the, uh, you know, the NCAA investigated Florida State for academic fraud. And I was saying, well, why did this? why was there academic fraud here? And you start peeling back the layers and you begin to realize a lot of these athletes were had third grade, sixth grade reading levels. One kid, the nose guard, tested out as having an IQ of 60, which made him literally mentally retarded. And yet he went on to get a, a college degree from Florida State, you know, menial work afterward. Um, and, and, and so my question is, is this, why do we allow athletes who are so underprepared for the university into these universities? Um, doesn't that just fuel the cynicism that the public feels toward the college enterprise? It absolutely does, and I don't think we should. That's that's the role of the institution. You know, the, the you know as a as an organization, as an association, the NSA certainly can't tell institutions who they can admit. We do tell them who they, can, who they can play, what the academic eligibility is for them to play, and it's, it's, it's a relatively low bar at some institutions, no question about it. Um, I, think it's, I think it's just patently wrong. Mm -hmm. I wanted to use the word immoral mm -hmm. to bring in individuals who you know can't be academically su successful, mm -hmm. who you know can't be. There may be some who you have questions about whether they can. Mm -hmm. And I, so, so I, again, I think that, you know. Uh, and you feel like the NCAA is hamstrung because of court decisions uh, that, that effectively knocked out the, the minimum SAT standards? Is that right? No, they won that case. You, yeah, we, we won well, the case. Well, you went back and revised. You, you got yeah, rid of but, the, but look, the minimum. But look, you know, we, we've got really great data that's, that, that will tell you that the SAT is not a very good predictor. Core courses in high school 
is the good predictor. You can combine that with standardized tests and you have even a better predictor and that's what we do. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, the issue is that institutions find a way around their own admission policies to allow uh, students and others, it's not just students, uh, to come in who, who do not meet the, the minimum standards for, uh, for admission. I don't like it. I don't, I don't think it's the right thing to do, and I don't, and frankly, in some cases, I don't think it's the moral thing to do. Mm -hmm. Taylor? I, I agree with Mel. I agree with the NCAA on this. They are, but the people at the NCAA who work on academic standards will tell you themselves. They are, they are quite candid. We're trying to shine a light in the basement. We can't set high academic standards for institutions. That's up to them. All we're trying just to, to lift the most egregious cases from the bottom. Uh, this is a failure on the part of the academic institutions. Now, having said that, I, I do want to try to break radically. I think we are, in danger, we are in danger of getting lost in the weeds on where the real issue of NCAA reform, the nub is. And that is, is on amateurism. We've been here, I don't know how long, we haven't mentioned amateurism. That is the basis of all of the controversy, and in my view, it has, it has tongue-tied everyone and prohibited the most basic function of a free society and certainly a, a, a college, which is free inquiry. You have this amazing laboratory of applied economics and pure knowledge going on right at the campus in the giant stadium, and the last thing you'll find on campus are courses inquiring as to how that works and how much the guard on the football team is really worth the university, because you can't even open the door to those questions without um, evaluating amateurism and where does it come from. And amateurism does not come in law. It is imposed on the athletes without their consent. The athletes are not members of the NCAA. They have no vote. They don't get to vote on these things. You, and all the stuff on the pro football, on the playoff, this week about whether to have a national playoff, you never saw anything about what the opinion of the athletes were. They are not consulted. This is an institutional thing. But the most important aspect of the amateur rule is that it's not done by law. You could not write a law in any state legislature to say that this class of person who's generating money from their extraordinary talent and their extraordinary effort shall have no um, right to ask for it. To, to, for compensation. You couldn't do a law. The only way you can do it is the universities get together through the NCAA. That's why it's a cartel. Every time adults have challenged it, the coaches or the football schools, the court have said, you can't do it. But the students haven't challenged it yet. It's working in that direction. And the way I like to think of it, to open up people's minds, because amateurism sounds wonderful, and it sounds like the Olympics, which, by the way, are no longer amateur. Um, and people need to think about that. that. That model changed dramatically and the world didn't end. Imagine if a college wanted to be consistent and say all students will be amateurs while they're here. You are purely students. And that means you, are, you cannot work in a pizza parlor to pay your tuition. You can't start Facebook and make a billion dollars. You can't be an entrepreneur. You can't be in a work study program. You can't get paid if you're a graduate teaching assistant. You are purely a graduate student. You are amateurs here to learn. This is the educational experience. That is preposterous. Nobody would even dream of that, and yet we don't blink to presume that we can say to athletes, not only can you not make money for the, have a portion of what you're generating, but we will call you dirty if you do. We will blacken your career. We will run you out. It's amazing to me that the adults in control of sports, without giving any rights to the athletes, manage to say to this group alone that we're gonna keep all the money, you can't bargain for it. If we do, we're gonna, we're gonna demonize you. And furthermore, we're doing it for your own good so that you can enjoy the blessings of being an amateur. But it's <laughs> preposterous. And then on top of that, on top of that, they have control beyond what any economic control. You, your mother can't get a Christmas card. You can't get a ride across campus. A $20 sport. North Korea is the only country in the world that has this level of social control over people without any basis of law and no participation or consent or right of 
of, of redress on the part of the athletes. They, have, they, they can get their scholarships yanked. They have no due process. They're excluded from the whole program. And when you, when you shackle people and strip them of rights, not just economic rights, you are setting in motion a formula for all kinds of exploitation, not just academic, not just economic, but even sexual, like at Penn State. Those athletes knew that if they raised their voices to protest what was going on, whatever knew, they, they had no protection. They could be run out of the campus. So you are the first way to protect student athletes for the NCAA, which professes to care about nothing more than the well-being of athletes, is to address their rights. But couldn't you argue, Taylor, that uh, you're saying the athletes are not paid, but a kid who gets a, a full ride to, to, to Stanford, uh, you know, we're talking four years, $50,000. Don't get diverted on pay. I'm talking ride. about their rights. I think that they have a right to bargain for uh, just like you do, and you should be commended uh, and everybody else for, for having a salary. To say that because they get a scholarship, they have no right to bargain for the, the millions they generate above that is like saying that because your pro employer provides health insurance, you don't need or deserve a salary. Uh, it's irrelevant to the basic question of do you have the rights to bargain. What we've done is to an inherited, we all live in an inherited world where we think of the university as dispensing value to the student. We, the teacher informs the pupil. The coach instructs the student. And to a large degree, that's true. I know Craig teaches his students. He cares about them. He, he, there's a lot of sentiment and, and, and all that. But in the, in the realm of big money athletics, the university is not creating value for the student so much, although they use the term student athlete to say this is a constant, even the national championship football game is a process of education for the student. But there, the student is creating value for the university. It goes the other way. And they are, we need to be mature enough and brave enough intellectually to separate the student function from the athlete function and not, have this, not follow this concoction of the student athlete, which makes them sound like they're a specialized creature understood only by the NCAA and best left to their control. They are students in the classroom, and the university should take control for them. They're athletes on the field. The coaches can take control for them. And to the degree that the, athlete, the coaches also want to build character, which is essential to sports and one reason why we love them, great. But deal with their rights and deal with the fact that they're generating a lot of money for the university, and they shouldn't apologize for wanting a piece of it. What if they don't generate revenue? Fine. The, the athletes are free to ask for money, and the university is free to laugh and say we don't have any. That doesn't create a problem. So what if you say to the student athletes, if you, if you want to participate in intercollegiate athletics, um, this is your choice. You can do this or you can not do this. But if you do this, you do it as an amateur. But I, I just want you to, there is, is no other choice. Well, that just isn't accurate. That no, just but isn't even accurate. By what right would you say that? In other words, this. No single university could do that if they had the rights. I'm, I'm, if, if you recognize that amateurism is not a law and it's bogus. Just, let, me, can I just, let me just say this. In 1982, Board of Regents yes. basically said that, in fact, the NCAA and intercollegiate athletics uh, does have the right and the need to protect amateurism. Well, that was kind of an obiter dictum. That was not the basis of that system. The basis Wait, of that decision was still, that this is a business. But and, it's the precedent that continues and that the to be NCAA, used by courts to make decisions. No, for. there haven't been any new oh, decisions. Oh, yes, there on. have been. The, the basis of the regent's decision was that the NCAA is a business and that you cannot limit the competitive rights of the football schools to make all the money and televise all the monies they want, uh, games they want. And it is a business. Basically, but it's only by colluding among the universities that you can say, as far as the athletes go, we are going to agree among ourselves that we will not offer them a nickel above the, the scholarship, and that, and that if we do, we will punish the university and we will punish the student. We set $57 million a year aside to assist student athletes. So what? what I'm saying. So what? I'm That's saying, not an insignificant I'm saying, amount of money. why can't. On what, by what right do you tell them that they can't, when they're being recruited, say, I'd like my scholarship plus $25,000 a year? Why can't they say because, that? Because we have a model that says that, that, that 
uh, that you're not going to read there's not going to be pay for play. You don't have to choose that model. Is that a legal model or just the universities getting together and saying we want to do that? That's it's not the universities getting together uh, other than to agree that, uh, that athletics will be performed on an amateur basis. That's exactly what I'm saying. Do let they me, have the right let, to let do Let me bring that? Joe in here. He's of course say so. Hand. The third time he raises his hand, I must go to him. Um, I want to go back, just very quickly go back to his question. Does a scholarship, ha does a scholarship in and of itself uh, create is, is a value for the athlete? My answer to that is in some cases yes, in many cases no. And so, you know, uh, if the scholarship is basically the, the yoke by which you lure these athletes onto your campus to play for your team so that the coach can make $3 million and you can have a big, better facility, you know, I would argue, and, and then you have the whole issue of academics and how do you think about it and how do you deal with that. Universities are ill-equipped to run professional sports. They're ill-equipped. They're really good at running lacrosse, but they're really ill-equipped to run big-time professional sports. It's, it's contrary to their mission. I think we'd be a lot better off if we got rid of the hypocrisy and he said, here's the value of your scholarship in cash. If you want to use it to get an education, we're all for it. If you want to use it to buy a sports car, that's your choice. Wally talked about choice. That's a choice. Wally keeps saying they have other choices. If you want to be a professional football player, you really don't have a choice. You need to go to college. And colleges know that, and they exploit that. And that's the essence of how big time college football works. So, you know, I agree with Taylor entirely on the issue of rights. But I think I'm a little more of a fire breather on the issue of money. And I think the one way to get rid of the hypocrisy is to pay the players and just acknowledge it. At Kentucky, and the basketball team in Kentucky, you know, John Calipari isn't telling these kids, come to my university because you're going to get a wonderful education and you're going to graduate from the University of Kentucky. He's telling them, I'm going to make you a star in a year. You'll be one and done. You don't even have to take any classes the second semester. No one will even notice. And then, and then you win the national championship and you all go pro, which, by the way, they all did. <laughs> no one in Kentucky is upset about this. Nobody's saying, oh, our whole team's a bunch of mercenaries. They're violating the collegiate model. They don't care. So Kentucky sort of shows that you don't have to actually be a hypocrite about this. You can be honest about what's going on. You're running a business. You have employees. You should pay them. It's really that simple. You know, a couple of years ago, I did a story on Ricky Rubio, the, the great, great point guard now with the, uh, the Minnesota Timberwolves. And um, it was interesting. This kid signed a contract at age 14 uh, in Spain. Um, his Nike deal, his professional club deal. Um, Thank you. And when I, when I profiled him, he was 20 years old. And I was wondering, am I going to get a kid who's just a nightmare and has had all sorts of corruption built into the system because he's basically been professionalized since the age of 14 when he first demonstrated value to, a, to an organization. And what I found was a kid who had his head screwed on straight, who was humble, who, who you know, he, he, everything was above board. There were, there, there were no street agents, there were no AAU coaches pulling him from club to club to club. And it did raise the question in my mind as to whether this amateur model, and, and Wally, I want you to address this. I mean, does this insistence on the amateur model, which says that kids cannot receive value for, uh, that they may bring to an organization, um, you know, does that create this whole underground economy and all of this corruption that your enforcement reps have to deal with on a, on a daily, daily basis? Well, I, obviously, I, I I can do no more than offer an opinion because I have no idea, in fact, whether it, whether it does or not. Um, you know, if you look at a if you look at a at a at a kid who um, who believes that he's going to become a professional basketball player and that he's going to make millions of dollars, and he comes from a very difficult uh, environment, and he's going to be able to buy a home for his mother. Uh, all of that looks extraordinary, extraordinarily appealing, and uh, and and he's probably and he gets to do that, uh, doing something he loves to do, playing a sport. 
um, and someone comes along and says, you know what, I think you're capable of doing all of this. Let me give you some counsel and advice. Let me tell you about the places. Let me get you hooked up with a coach who, who can take you on the road um, uh, and, and really um, get you ready for, for the big time and, and, and for the game. You see where all this is going to go. I'm not going to lay out the whole scenario. You know, Craig can lay it out a heck of a lot better than, than I can because he's, he's seen it up close and, and personal. But the, but the bottom line is that uh, you know, you've got to have a pretty exceptional individual at a really young age who is, who is able to uh, sort of have to deal with that and not come out of it a little jaded, it, it seems to me. I'm not saying it can't happen, but I think that, yeah. that that's probably the exception. Yeah. So, I, so, you know, basketball probably right now, I would say, has... Uh, has the, the, the dirtiest underbelly of any collegiate sport. And I'm not talking about it at the collegiate level, I'm talking about it, uh, you know, out of Craig's control. Mm -hmm. People who are, uh, who, are, who are trying to guide uh, young kids to where they go to college, what they major in, um, who they're gonna play for, who they need to transfer to because they're not getting enough uh, playing time, all this in the hope that they will have found another Michael Jordan that they can make a lot of money off of. Mm -hmm. I, I think it stinks. I just hate all of that. I just, I just, and, and to the degree to which the enterprise of intercollegiate athletics, the, the, the sport itself, with its, with its good things and its flaws has created that, uh, I hate it. I'm really sick at heart for that. Mm -hmm. I don't know how to fix it, and I don't think paying student athletes is gonna do it. Well, your uh, argument, Joe, is that we need to move, and correct me if I'm wrong, move to more of a free market system. Is that right? But let me ask you this. If we move to a free market system, what are the implications? I mean, what are the implications on the minor sports? I, I'm not. Do we know what's, what happens to college sports in general? I'm not arguing for a complete free market. It, it would be ruinous for the universities, which are already under tremendous um, financial pressure. Um, you know, I believe, I believe athletes should have rights, just as Taylor does. One of the rights should be to consult with somebody who can help guide you. They don't have to necessarily be a sleazebag. One of the reasons all these guys are sleazebag is because the whole thing's in the underground economy. Um, I also believe, I mean, I fundamentally believe that college football and men's basketball players who are generating income for universities should be classified as employees and should be paid. I created a convoluted system to do this that would have a salary. We don't have to get into all of that. My, I, I was not, I've never suggested that it should be a completely free market, but what I've suggested instead is that should, there should be some compensation. Would this put pressure on other sports? Yes, it would. But, you know, when you think about it, is it really the responsibility of underprivileged kids who are playing football to be subsidizing upper middle class kids playing lacrosse? I don't see it. If, well, if, the university, if the university believes lacrosse is something worth supporting, the university should support it and not say, well, the football team's going to take care of this. The system, if the athletes had rights and the market were introduced, I'm more of a free mar market person than, than uh, I mean, my dad's a dry cleaner. I've always been one. But um, in a weird way, this debate should be a debate between two kinds of conservatism free market conservatives and conservatives like David Brooks, who said I was wrong because there's some things more important than the free market, like orderly supervision of these gentlemen athletes, you know, old traditional, almost aristocratic uh, conservatism. Um, but to me, the sad thing is that without a free market that would result from giving the athletes their rights, and all that means is to say the amateurism we've been imposing is bogus, it always has been, and we're not going to enforce it, and you have rights, and we're going to adjust from there, at least the system would become more honest, and you'd be dealing with things more directly. Uh, are, how should the volleyball team be played for, paid for? Right now, it's being paid for off the backs of these other athletes without their consent. Um, and, it's, and nobody wants to talk about it, and you've got kind of a casino mentality in the athletic departments. 
because the big money sports create these big contracts and all the other coaches come running into the office and say, I see you've got all these billions of dollars and a lot of uh, millions and a lot of it's on the table here because you didn't have to pay the players and we know you didn't generate all that either so we want our volleyball and swimming program to be a little bit more on the model of March Madness too. So we get extra, I had several university presidents tell me, not for the record, they wouldn't let me print it, that their own salary was two to three times higher than what it would otherwise be because their trustees were embarrassed by the gap between them and the football coach. Mm -hmm. Now it's not that they are getting paid out of the athletic budget, it's just that this casino money uh, that comes in there off the table, everybody wants to take a bite out of it. Uh, and it creates an unstable and dishonest and and the saddest thing about it is this is at a university where there ought to be free inquiry. And what do students learn about the value of, I'm more concerned about the four-year guard at Clemson. He's playing guard for four years. He's been doing it his whole life. What does the current system teach him about the value to him of something that he's devoted his whole life to that he has extraordinary talents from? He's not going pro. The NCAA is right. But the lesson from that is not shut up and be happy you're an amateur, it's you have a right to push this university to tell you what is the value of what you're doing to the university at the only time in your life that you're gonna have a chance to maximize the value and have a little nest egg from something that the whole world thinks that you're great at. I wanna to go to uh, Craig, um, do you have any thought on this? And then I wanna do one quick question then we're gonna turn it over to Q&A for, for the, for, for, uh, the crowd here. And if you do have a question, raise your hand so the uh, folks with the microphones can find you and uh, say your name when you do. But Craig, Craig. What I noticed with student athletes today, especially football and basketball players, is that most of, most of the guys I'm recruiting come from underprivileged situations. And, uh, and currently, the, the, the value of their scholarship is not equal to the cost of going to school, if you understand what I mean, you know? So their, their tuition, room and board, and books are paid for, but I've got guys who can't take girls out on dates because they can't hold down a job and study and be a basketball player at the same time. Um, you know, if they, if they need a ride to the airport, in our case is, you know, 45 minutes away, they can't afford a, a a taxi. They've got to make sure they have a friend who can take them. And you know, the, 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 I, I would like to see them have more of a regular student body experience. Uh, and I'm trying to create that myself through you know teaching, uh, to treating them like more than just athletes. But you know, it's 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 really hard on campus because. These guys are rock stars in everything but their wallets. That's true. Okay, so I, I'm gonna I'm gonna throw out a question, and it's a simple yes or no answer because I want to save time for uh, for questions out here. But my question is for this. I want to roll through the line here. Um, personally, I tend to I, I tend to believe that college sports is so popular in this country that it's going to survive no matter what. Right? I went to the University of Florida. My friends are going to insist that a a, a bunch of young men wearing the uniform of the Florida Gators are going to play the F Florida State Seminoles on a Saturday in, uh, in the fall, and the market's just going to dictate that. Well, I think what's up for grabs here, right, is, is the, the underlying economic system. Are we going to have a system where the athletes, um, that, that looks like the one we have right now, or are the athletes going to be paid above um, and beyond the current cap that is set by the NCAA? Yes or no question. What's your time frame? Uh, uh, 10 years from now, because there are a couple big court cases in the pipeline right now, and hopefully they'll be resolved by then. Will we have the collegiate model in place in 10 years? No. Yes, but not for the reasons that you think. <laughs> well, that begs for a follow, doesn't it? Um, yes, college sports, not the current model. Yes, we'll still have college sports. Okay. We will not have the current model. You will not have the current model. Wow, well, let's do another hour on all that then. But let's, let's get to your questions here. In the back. Hi, <clears throat> I'm uh, Donnie Lefton from Aspen in Miami. <clears throat> I guess my newfound uh, claim to fame is that uh, 
I live next door to a guy by the name of LeBron James. <laughs> so all of a sudden, I've become very, very popular. Uh, I've been a devoted sports fan for over 70 years, all of them. And I cannot begin to tell you the feeling of disgust and upset that I have encountered, as has most people, particularly over the last 10 years, with what that has happened, which has so disparaged college, or not college, professional and college sports in general from the steroids and the baseball and the track and the cycling, um, the Ohio State, my alma mater, and, and, and Miami and, and, and New Orleans. And then, and then I have a grandson that plays football for a high school. Uh, okay, my, uh, yeah, has Question. plays football for a high school. My daughter withdrew him from the high school after the Sandusky event because she did not want him associated anymore with it. How much of an impact is that going to have on future sports and discourage young men who ordinarily would play with them, as well as viewers who no longer view them and watch them to the degree that they used to? Anyone? Want to take that? I want to make sure I understood the question. So the question is what impact will drugs have? Will no, the scandals, the various scandals. Oh, the various scandals. OK. Yeah. I don't think it'll have any impact. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, there've been there's been scandals for as long as I can remember in sports, as well as almost everywhere else. And you know, and, I, I mean, and we're just so imperfect as humans, and we just continue to foul up and phenomenally. Um, um, Taylor, help me out here. You know, I mean, in, in ways that that draw such great attention to us. You know, we we rise to the top, and then we just or we destroy ourselves. Um, so I, I, I don't know that the scandals are going to have a, a lot of impacts. Make, it, it makes me, my stomach turn as well. I hate it, but I'm not sure how much impact it will have. Who's next? Let's go over here. Okay. Excuse me. Hi. Um, I just have a question on whether this is beyond sports on the university side for those of you who have explored it. Because I live in the land of technology, build technology. And certainly tech transfer and patents put the burden on engineering and the sciences to fund English departments and other things. And so I, it seems to me that there perhaps is a bigger issue beyond sports and it just is getting funneled in this direction. Sounds like just a comment. Okay, we have a question. Yeah, I, no, there's a question. And I love the question. Okay. I, I agree with you 100%. Um, you know, um, um, the former president at, at Harvard, um, Bach, you know, lamented the impact of corporate America on, on higher education. Uh, but the day's gone. I mean, that day is gone. That's, gonna, that's happening. Institutions are investing millions of dollars in, in researchers. Uh, there are a lot more research faculty who are million dollar employees than there are coaches who are million dollar employees, a lot more. Uh, and so this issue is not just isolated to intercollegiate athletics in terms of economic, the, the impact of economics. to the universities so that they can be sold in tech transfer, similar to student athletes perhaps giving up some of their rights. And I, I was just provoking to see if you guys had explored <coughs> other students signing away their intellectual great, capital. It's a great thought and we'll, we'll get right to work no, on no, it. Should, well, that's going to come up in the book. I have an answer, uh, at least a partial answer. They have to sign over their rights because it's at least presumed that they might have rights to sign over. The sports system presumes that they have none. Uh, but they are related, and it is an issue. And the issue of governance in all of academia and higher education and how it relates to education is, is a huge crisis. And in that sense, I'm saying sports is somewhat insulated from things that are tearing through higher education right now. What I'm saying about sports is that it'll be better on its governance and transparency and balance too, if it starts with basic honesty in what the rights of the athletes are. Man, I've got a lot of respect for you as a, as a civil rights historian, and I'm so glad about it. <laughs> <laughs> because otherwise, yeah, all right, that's fine. So, um, here. 
The NCAA's argument, I'm here. Dan Fuda, I um, went to USC, and I love big time college sports, but fundamentally, it's, it's, it puts me in a moral quandary. So the NCAA has this inherent position that amateurism is an inherent good. That's the basis of their argument, that amateurism, as we view it, is an inherent good. It, as you said earlier, teaches resilience, teamwork, spirit of excellence, creates future leaders. And all of these other ideas that are sort of derived from muscular Christianity. And I thought in the Atlantic article, there was a very important point made about where our notions of amateurism have evolved from and their sort of aristocratic background. And maybe if you could talk more about that and say that point to the audience, because I thought it was very, very important to our thinking on the matter. Well, well here, let me sort of kind of reframe it a little bit. And uh, I mean, couldn't we define amateurism however we want to define it, right? Couldn't we say if Tim Tebow is playing for the University of Florida that, yeah, he can sign a contract with Nike. I mean, couldn't the NCAA do that if they wanted to? Well, I think, I mean, absolutely, you could, you could, the, the NCAA, when you say the NCAA, I assume you mean the colleges and universities, because they're the ones who make the decisions. The members, this schools not, of the... This is not the yeah. folks in Indianapolis, Indiana Correct. that do this. Right. Uh, so could you say, for example, that the value of a scholarship should be raised to the full cost of attendance? Well, yeah, I think that's a great idea, and, and we've, we've got that out there, and it's been defeated once. We'll keep pushing it out there. I hope it works. Uh, we've said, uh, you know, let's have student athletes uh, negotiate for multi-year contra- multi um, uh, scholarships. scholarships. I think that's a great idea. I like that idea a whole lot. Uh, and do I believe that those disrupt, interfere with the, with the uh, definition of amateurism as we define it in, in intercollegiate athletics? I certainly don't think that it does. I don't, I don't have any issues you with are, that at all. I mean, you are defining it the way you feel like defining it. You have defined a scholarship of being value but not being paid. And they were going to add a $2,000 stipend to that, which they're defining as not being paid. But, but, if somebody, but if somebody from Ohio State takes his own personal property and sells it to somebody to get tattoos, that is an unethical violation of amateurism, and they have to be suspended. It's your definition. Your definition. Yes. You can define it any way you want. I, I, and you choose to define it in a way that's deeply onerous. And those who choose to play understand that. They do have choice. That's, 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 that simply isn't accurate that they don't have choice. What is their choice? The NAIA, is that what you're referring to? The, the, the NAIA, they can, they can uh, you know, they can, they can play uh, sports on uh, you know, outside of, of the NCAA, they don't have to play in college sports at all. Uh, you know, they can go to Europe and play. There are any number of things that they can They go to the pros. Any number of things that they can do. That's Baseball good, players could go straight out of high school to the that pros. Is a choice. Why would they not make that choice? That is a choice. Baseball players, baseball players and hockey players do have a legitimate choice. Yeah. Because there are minor leagues for baseball and there are minor leagues for hockey. That's the minor true. league for football is the SEC. Everybody knows that. It's Bob Schieffer. He doesn't need a mic. <laughs> what time is this? It's funny. You got two more minutes. Uh, who else? Um, the. Uh, a number of things you've talked about imply uh, corruption outside of college athletics, but um, I think a number of us have seen kind of things that are going on at, at the administrative level of universities that kind of lend us to let it, lead us to believe that uh, there's things going on that are uh, hard to explain. Just as a couple of examples before I ask the question. Um, first of all, we've all heard college presidents in the BCS say, that the real reason they don't want a playoff system is because one more game would harm their players, yet the NCAA sanctions multiple games at the lower levels. And of course, you know, they can do what they want, it's all money. But 
we understand that they're saying things that are irrational and don't have any real basis in fact. Do you have a question, and, sir? Sorry? Do you have a question? I do. I just wanted to give examples. Right. The second example is the same thing having to do with the four players. I need your, I need your, sorry. I need your question. I, I guess the question is, why is it that nobody talks about what's happening at the upper levels that's brought on by athletics and, and the size of athletics and the importance of athletics among the alumni and the money that it brings? It's, it's beyond just the athletes themselves. Who wants to take that? Of course, people love sports. <laughs> Look at the number of sports writers in your hometown newspaper, uh, if it still survives, compared to the number of higher education reporters. And that's, a, that, that's a measure of societal preference, and so everything is within this context. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. I, I love sports. I'm just saying we've got to use our minds, too, and not be brainless fans when we investigate how the system is put together. One last question here. Well, can I just make one more comment to yeah. this? My, my current boss, Dr. Mark Emmert, who's the president of the NCA, former president of two other universities, often says if it weren't her for, for hypocrisy, college presidents would have nothing to say. <laughs> That's true. Let's go over here. This will be the last question. Thanks, uh, Chris Lewinsky, Boston University. Don't want to bleed the 5 o'clock panel in here, but uh, we talked about athletes having a choice. At Boston University, we looked at the brains of multiple former college football players who just played college football. 100% have chronic traumatic encephalopathy, a degenerative brain disease brought on by the trauma they get. So not only are they not paid, they're getting a brain disease from playing the sport. I, uh, the NFL started warning their athletes in 2009 of this fact. They might get dementia from playing the game. NCAA created a poster to match the NFLs, except for they removed the part about dementia and CTE being a risk. So the concussion warning poster in NCAA locker rooms does not give that risk of CTE or dementia. I asked NCAA to change that. I talked to David Klossner in January. A vote was taken last week. Thumbs down. You're not warning the athletes of a risk they're exposing themselves to. How do you defend that? I don't. I don't know why they would turn it down. I don't understand that. I actually think we may arrive at a time in America where football will be suspended. So will you, will, can you tell me that we'll, we'll put that on a poster for the fall? I, no, I can't tell you that because I'm not, I don't get a vote. I don't get to vote. That decision was made by a, a committee of the membership. I don't get to vote. Let's go. We're going to wrap it up here. But that's a, you know, the football idea. Come back for the 5 o'clock panel right here. It's all about the future of football. So thank you very much to the panelists and everyone who came.